Hey everybody, very, very good to be back with you. My name is Will, and here we are again, Acts 16. If you've got your Bibles with you, that passage we had read part two of our look at this church in Philippi, this church that would become 10 years later, the church that Paul writes to in Philippians and praises for the growth, for the depth of community that is there in Philippians. So I want to um, go again into this passage and I said really that there were two things that I wanted to look at. Last week we looked at one and this week I wanted to look at. And these are what I think are two foundation stones that were in place in these very early days, in the very start of the church that would become that church 10 years down the line. Two foundational things I think for us to think through uh, when it comes to planting. That's whether we're planting for ourselves or thinking about supporting and enabling and equipping other people, other churches to be planted. And those two foundational things Last week we looked at presence. I said that the number one priority is to be present with God. Really the only priority is to be present with God and enjoy being with God. And from out of that, churches will flow. And the second thing is today we're going to look at valuing. What does it mean to value something? And in particular, to put value over cost or value over price. So that's where I want to go today. And I think those two things were in place here in this church in Philippians right from the early days. So cost and value it's been said that in our world today in our generation in our um, western world people know the price of everything and the value of nothing people know the price of everything and the value of nothing and i think there's some truth to that it's been wonderful to see my kids in this lockdown period just the ages they are they've begun to play with money and think through what money might mean for them, which is a good thing because uh, in lockdown, because we've maybe had a little bit more exposable income than uh, expendable income than we normally have. So the fact that they're playing with money is just about okay. But what they're doing with the money is starting to work out the cost of things. But really, they've they've not really got any sense. And so for them, a 50p is worth more than a 1p because a 1p is round, whereas a 50p has edges. But that sort of makes life difficult because then 20p, they like more than a 50p. So 20p becomes more valuable than a 50p. So they have this strange understanding of what value and cost is really all about. But what I want to say is that in this church in Philippians, right from the early days, there was a strong sense of what was valuable and therefore what they could afford in terms of cost and price, what was valuable. I want to say that Paul and his team and Lydia and the jailer and the the origins of this church, they knew the value of things. And one of the things that 10 years later, when you look at the book of Philippians, Paul praises the church for. In fact, the whole occasion for him writing that letter is that the Philippians, this church, have bought him a gift. He's in prison. And no one else is looking around for support. No one else is bringing him any support. But the church in Philippi do. And they send someone, they send Epaphroditus with this package, this gift of money and food, and they give it to Paul. And so Paul praises them for their generosity. Right at the heart of this church, 10 years down the line in in Philippi, is a church full of generosity. And they model Christ, he says, because they are generous. And if we want to plant churches and if we want to be churches that then plant other churches, right at the heart of what we need is a generosity, a generosity of spirit that comes from, I think, having an appropriate sense of what's valuable and therefore what the price of things are. And this is really, really important when it comes to planting, because when it comes to planting life things are costly. Things are costly. Church planting costs. It costs time and energy and effort. Uh, It costs uh, resources. It costs a great deal. And some of you will already be counting the cost. I can almost see through my screen those of you involved in the uh, finances of St George is already thinking through these things. I know that there's cost in planting, but what is the value of planting. If that's the cost, what's the value? The value of planting is the kingdom of God. The value of planting is to see God on the move, to see God do a new thing. Um, I spoke last week about some of the work we did in Nottingham and I remember working with one young guy called Tom. He doesn't mind me telling this story. And Tom um, really returned to faith, returned to church after a long time away. And Tom, one night, one evening at one of our um, gatherings, he had a deep encounter with the Holy Spirit, a deep experience of the Holy Spirit at work in his 
life. And he's, and a few months later, I got, had the privilege of baptizing Tom. But he said in that moment, he described it to me like this. He said, Will, it's like I walked out of that place and the sky was bluer. The grass was greener. The trees were more full. And I thought to myself, what a, a st- I couldn't come up theologically, doctrinally with a better, ex- uh, a better expression of what God does in people's lives. God transforms lives. And we see that in this passage again, this jailer who's in this awful situation, this young slave girl held in bondage is freed. Astonishing transformation that God causes. That's what the value of church planting is, to see the kingdom of God come, to transform lives, to transform communities in every way that you can imagine them being transformed for their good and for their flourishing. That's what the value is. And when we know the value, when we know the value of God himself at work, his presence at work in the world, then the cost of things begins to take on a different perspective. So I wanna just talk um, for the next few minutes about cost and value a little bit. Then I'm gonna talk about what we do with our resources. And then finally, I'm gonna ask the question, okay, well, how do you develop a posture like that? So cost and value, resources, and then how do you develop a posture like that, a posture of generosity, a posture of knowing the value and um, knowing the cost of things. We see, um, so first of all, cost and value. If you you have your Bibles open in in chapter 16, we see some interesting things that happen. And one of the interesting things, I want to come back to Lydia in the moment because she's important, but I want to go to where Paul and Silas go to a place of prayer. This is verse 16. They're met by a female slave who has a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. And then what happens is Paul um, sees her, she cries out, continually cries out. She recognizes Christ in them. And so Paul says, in the name of Jesus be healed. The spirit is come out of her, comes out of her. And then what happens is these men who have held her um, are deeply annoyed because they've lost now their income. You see in that moment value and cost playing out, I want to suggest. The value of this young girl's life, the value of her healing, the value of God being at work in transforming her life. And yet the game that these owners, they're described as here, the game that these owners are playing is a game where they're purely interested in cost, in economic gain, in what they can get for themselves. How broken and hurting And vulnerable must you be that the only way you can see to get through the day, to get enough for yourself, is to destroy someone else's existence. This is going on all over the world in in our world right now, even today. And we must pray and pray and pray that people's lives are manipulated and controlled. People are held in bondage so that others might receive financial reward. That is a complete misreading of what God is up to in the world. It's a complete distortion, the worst possible distortion of the good order, the good world that God has created, where human lives are destroyed for financial effort. Everything is flipped on its head. And yet Paul and Silas come along and they heal this girl. Then for them, the value of this situation, the value of this girl is her identity as a child of God, a daughter of God. Everything else falls by the wayside. So you see immediately economic cost and deep kingdom value playing out. And then we see Paul and Silas find themselves in prison. And what do they do when they're in prison? We saw this last week, verse 25. They pray and they sing hymns to God. We've gone from these men, these owners, who in order to protect their own lives, manipulate and destroy someone else's life, to now seeing Paul and Silas in prison when the threat to their own life is happening, find themselves in this deep movement of of prayer towards God. In other words, when their life is under threat, they don't seek to manipulate and to control. When their life is under threat, they seek to open themselves up to the living God. That's the difference between cost and value. And we see it play out in this passage. So that's the first thing, cost and value. That's what I'm talking about. And secondly, I want to talk about resources, really explicitly about resources. Because like I say, planting is costly in terms of God calling you into a new thing. It's costly mentally, emotionally. It's costly in terms of time, but it is particularly costly in terms of resources. And there are lots of people in the Church of England and other churches right now who are asking the question in in this lockdown period with a potential fear around resources, 
what should we be doing? Is it really right to be starting new churches when there seems to be so many existing churches which are struggling? And so that question of resource is a really live one. And what I want to suggest that we see in this passage is an appropriate use of resource. That once you've begun to prioritise value over cost, that you can begin to see the appropriate place that you might place your resources. And this is why I want to hone in on on this woman, Lydia. So we read in verse 14 that Paul and Silas have gone to pray. It's the Sabbath. That's what they do. They go to pray. Their instinct is the presence of God. And then out of this, this encounter occurs. One of those listening was a woman from, by the way, whenever you pray, it's never between you and God. So often when you find yourself praying, God does new things with new people. Opening yourself up to prayer will open yourself up to other people. Anyway, one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatia named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. And then verse 15, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. Lydia. Some people say, and I think they're right, that Lydia was the first convert in Europe. The first person in the whole of Europe to be converted to Christianity is right here. And who is it? It's a woman. And it's more than a woman. It's a businesswoman. A confident, capable, sassy, powerful businesswoman, independent woman. At no point in this passage do we get a comment about her husband. This is her on her own. And she's powerful enough to be a dealer in purple cloth. So she's, she's clever. She's got a good business sense. She's made money from it enough that she has her own household that she is responsible for and can allow the disciples to come into. That's who she is. That's the first convert, convert in the whole of Europe. A confident, powerful, independent woman. Amen. And Lydia then invites them into her home. She, in other words, has resource. God has blessed her with resource through her business sense, through her business acumen. She has made money. She has made resource. And what does she do with that resource? She shares it with the disciples. And from that point on, the church is born. And then at the end of the passage, when Paul and Silas are released from prison, they go to Lydia's home. That seems to have become the base for the church. Whatever we say of the church 10 years down the line, this church which was born, it began in Lydia's home. And it wouldn't have had a place to begin if it weren't for the resources of this woman. And then we see later on uh, this jailer comes to faith. And we didn't read all of this passage, but you can read about this jailer, this this, um, uh, prison keeper who comes to faith. And the first thing that he does is he invites Paul and Silas into his home. There is hospitality that happens in his home. Hospitality is impossible if you have nothing to be hospitable with if you don't have a body to be hospitable with, and also if you don't have resources to be hospitable with. To be hospitable with your home assumes that you have a home in the first instance. To have resources to share assumes that you have resources in the first place. What I wanna say is that we see in this church right from day one is an appropriate use of resource. An ability to recognize the value. You know, Lydia is, is converted and therefore she sees a whole new value structure, a whole new economic structure. And from that, because she recognises the value, she's able to account the cost. That's what happens in this church. So an appropriate use of resources. And I want to encourage you today, if you are somebody who's involved in church planting, again, either because you're going to go or because you're going to stay and pray and support, I wanted to encourage you to think through how you might use your resources. And I also feel like I want to say to those of you who are maybe thinking, you know, I don't see myself as leading a plant. Whenever I think of church planting teams, I see people up front. I see people with guitars. I see people with microphones, preaching, leading, whatever it is. But yet you see yourself somehow involved in a plant and maybe you can't just hold those two things together. I want to suggest to you that maybe part of your role is going to be to create resource for church plants. That if you have a vision or a dream to be involved in business, to start something new or to to develop in your work that you're involved in existingly, to do better in your work than you are at the moment, whatever it might be, to grow, in other words, resource, I want to encourage you that that is just as appropriate and just as godly as anything else, just as holy a calling as any other part of our planting experience. And so push into that today. Maybe that's what God is asking of you today. Lydia was able to start this church in her home because she had a home, she had resource. 
How then do you develop? This is my third point and I want to end here. How do you develop a posture like that? I've said that in the church in Philippi from day one was this recognition of value and this holding therefore of cost as relative. There was a posture of generosity therefore that flowed out of this. How do you get there? Because for some of us, that's a scary piece. You know, it's hard to, to so imagine the kingdom of God as valuable that we might relativize the current cost, the current resource that we have, that we might use that resource to put into church plants at great cost, potentially. How do you, how do you develop that within you? And, and, and what I want to suggest is that it comes out of our recognition of our own need. That, that what made Paul a planter, somebody who could sit in a prison cell and still pray to God, who could give his whole life, not just his money, but his whole life to this. What makes someone like that is somebody who knows that God is for them, who knows that they are deeply loved, that once they were in need. Paul talks about himself as, you know, I had nothing to, I was the worst of sinners, even persecuting Christians, and yet God came and found me and saved me. Paul has this deep conviction that God has loved him, has found him, and has transformed his life. That once he was poor, but now he is rich. That's the experience that Paul has, and that's what enables him to do this. And whenever we talk in the Christian life about cost and value, it always comes back to that. How do we see ourselves? Ronald Rollheiser, who's a Catholic spiritual writer, I, I love reading him, um, tells this story. And he tells this story about a man who uh, he, Rollheiser actually did this man's funeral. And this man had lived till he was 95. Um, and then he had died, Rollheiser did his funeral. And this man was um, a great man of his community. He was known in his community, he was a Cath Catholic. He went to, to church, Catholic guy. And um, through his life, he had given money away. He had supported noble causes. Um, he had done all, the, all of these great things. And then he, uh, he died when he was 95. Ron Rollheiser does the funeral. Rollheiser says that at the funeral, one of the sons of this man, this man had five sons, stood up to talk about his father. And he tells, and um, Rollheiser says that this, this guy said about his father, he said, um, in the Bible, it says that um, 70 years is the measure of a man, that God gives 70 years to a man. And maybe 80, if you're very blessed, you might get 80 years. He says, well, God gave my father 95. He gave him up to 90. And he says, I've asked myself the question, why did God give him an extra 10 years or an even an extra 15 years? Why did he get those extra years? And the son says that, you know, all through my father's life, he says from the moment he could tie his shoelaces to the moment he got to, to, into his 80s, he never, ever asked for help. He had everything he needed. He, his, he had a good family. His family were very wealthy. He could invest in his companies. He had all this resource. He could give money away. He could afford to give money away. He was in need of nothing. He had a great wife, great family. He was in need of nothing, he said. But when he got to 80, um, in his late 80s and then into his 90s, he became very, very poorly. And he had to go into a home. And in the home, he lost the ability to feed himself, to clothe himself. And so he had to have people around him to help him to do all those things. And he says, I firmly believe, this son says, the firmly believe that the reason I got to, that my father had those extra years, was it was only in those extra years that he learned how to say these words, help me. It was only when he was in his 90s that he could honestly look at somebody else, honestly, and say, I need your help. He said up to that point, he had never, ever needed to ask that. Rollheiser says, that needs to be our attitude with God. And he said, God will get us there eventually. We will, be, we will have to get to the point where we'll have to ask for help. And the question is, when will it happen? Will it happen today or will we wait until we're 90 for it to happen? But it will one day happen where we'll, be, where we'll have to ask for God's help. And that is the posture, I think, that allows us to be generous, that allows us to look at the value and count the cost. Can we say, help me? And if we're in a position of help, in a position of need, if we recognise the need that we were in and therefore all that God has gifted us, then we will become people of generosity. And so the last question I wanted to leave you with, just before I go over time, the last question I wanted to leave you with is this. When you read this passage, Acts 16, and you think about planting, who do you imagine yourself to be? Who do you imagine yourself to be?
So often when I've looked at this passage, I've imagined myself to be Paul and Silas. You know, I talk about mission. I talk about evangelism. I've been part of a church planting team. I get the privilege of being involved in planting now. I'm Paul and Silas. I'm going to go and help those poor people, whoever it is I'm going to go and help. I want to see churches go and meet those people who need help. But I've begun to see as I've read this passage and I've prayed over it this week. I need to see myself again and again as that slave girl. As somebody who's in utter need. I need to see myself again and again as that jailer. And the more and more in my prayer, my devotion, in my worship, the more I start from that place of, I am in utter need here, Lord. I need you. And my life was in utter, before you met with me, my life was in utter need. And now you have met with me and I have everything I need. That's the only way in which my heart will shift. That's the only way in which I will become that person of generosity, in which I will become that person who's able to see value over cost. So let me ask that question of you this morning. Who do you see yourself as in this passage? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that when it comes to your good news, we are not in the place of power. We're not in the place of even of confidence. We're in the place of need. And I thank you that when we were in that need, Lord God, you met with each of us. You poured out your love. You found us, you sought us out and you loved us. You gave us everything we need. And so, Lord, as we dig into that truth, as we make that truth a reality in our lives, may you shape us to be people of generosity and may you help us, whether we go, whether we stay, to establish churches of generosity, of hospitality, of kindness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.